Israel Finkelstein is a leading figure in the archaeology and history of ancient Israel. Over 40 years of fieldwork and research, he has helped to change the way archaeology is conducted, the Bible is interpreted, and the history of Israel is reconstructed. I sat down with Israel over several sessions to talk about how a lifetime of work has informed the story of ancient Israel. Israel, welcome back. We're at Kiryat Yerim again to continue our discussion of the northern Israelite traditions that uh, have come down to us, in particular in the book of uh, Judges. Last time we talked about the stories of Jacob and of the Exodus. Uh, today I want you to start by giving uh, a broad overview of the book of Judges itself, and then we'll get into some of the details of the Savior stories. Yeah. We need to start by saying that uh, the book of Judges is part of the Deuteronomistic history in the Bible, which means the history of Israel uh, described from the days of the conquest of Canaan, well, Deuteronomy, of course, in the background, but the conquest of Canaan, then the period of the judges, quote unquote, and then we go into uh, the um, events that lead to the rise of the monarchy and to the two Hebrew kingdoms later until the destruction of Jerusalem. So this is the scope, and the book of Judges is there as one part of the Deuteronomistic history. And indeed, we can see that the book has Deuteronomistic language. So as we read it today, there is a lot Deuteronomistic in it and also post-Deuteronomistic because the book is not uniform. And basically, we can divide it into two. The first part is the more interesting for us today, uh, the part of the book which tells the heroic stories of saviors who come to uh, save the people of Israel from enemies uh, all around them in local, you know, events here and there. So basically this part goes from chapter 3 to chapter 12. There are the stories of the saviors, of the heroes, and we know them very well. Ehud, Barak, Deborah, Gideon, Jephthah, and then also there are two places um, in the book of Judges where we get a list of what in scholarship is called minor judges, very telegraphic descriptions of a few of them. We will speak about it later. So this is the first part. The second part of the book of Judges is a different story, is basically later chronologically apparently. Over there one can find, for instance, the very well-known uh, story of Samson and other traditions which uh, will not be discussed uh, by us today. Now, the part which we wish to discuss has a very clear structure which also discloses uh, the goal of the authors. And I'm speaking now about the Deuteronomistic authors, which means, uh, let's say, Jerusalem of the 7th century BC. There is a cycle there in every story, Ehud, Barak, Gideon, and so on. The cycle is sin of the people, God gets angry, punishes the people of Israel, the local people there, with some sort of a calamity, enemy that presses them. And then the people cry for the help of God. God sends a savior, a hero, to save them. There's this deliverance from the distress, from the enemy. But the people of Israel again go into sin and punishment and cry and so on. All this, in fact, aims at the end, at the last verse of the book of Judges, where it says, in those days there was no king in Israel. Every person could do what was good in his own eyes. So the whole cycle comes to show that something needs to change and it is some sort of a promo to the rise of the monarchy, a promo to the rise of the Davidites, to King David, to the Davidic dynasty. So this is the aim of the book. However, I suggest that today we take a closer look because today I don't want to go into details of the Deuteronomic, Deuteronomistic history. Behind the Deuteronomistic history, when one looks at the geography, of the stories and also possibly the historical background, it is quite clear that there is an older layer. And that older layer comes from the north, from the northern kingdom before the Deuteronomistic history, which means possibly even before the destruction of the northern kingdom 
And this is our goal today. Now give us the specific background to the Savior stories. Before speaking about the Savior stories, we, I think we have to acknowledge, uh, again, we spoke about it in some of our previous conversations, that we are not in the order given by the biblical authors of the history of ancient Israel. That is to say, patriarchs, Egypt, uh, coming Exodus, judges, uh, turmoil of the period of the judges, and then monarchy. There is no period of the judges, so we need to identify the period behind each and every story, and possibly even we are not speaking about a uniform situation. So one uh, story can speak about this phase in the history of ancient Israel, and another story about another phase, another moment in history. Now, there was a German scholar uh, in the 60s who uh, wrote about it. His name was Richter, and he was the first to suggest that behind the Book of Judges, there is an old book which came from the Northern Kingdom, and he called the book the Book of Saviors. And then there was a little bit of concern and dispute among biblical scholars of his time and later, uh, who belongs and who not. Richter suggested that the background is somewhere in the ninth century. We will need to speak about it. I'm not so sure uh, about the compilation, neither about the compilation nor about the historical reality, let's say, behind the, behind the stories. Another thing to acknowledge is that the stories are layered, so you, one cannot uh, open, let's say, chapter 4 in the book of uh, Judges about Barak or, or the Song of Deborah and read the whole thing you know, in one go and say, well, we are in uh, a one phase of history here because there were additions and reductions which go relatively late, uh, I suppose, into the at least the Persian period, uh, if not slightly slightly later. And the task that uh, is in front of us when we speak about the Book of Saviors in uh, the book of, behind the Book of Judges is, first of all, to identify the old layers in each and every story, and then to seek the reality, the historical reality, if there is one, behind them, and then to understand the geography. Now, generally speaking, we are in the geography of the Northern Kingdom. And this is why Richter and others, and me too, we are always speaking about the Book of Saviors or the Savior stories as representing the Northern Kingdom because the arena is always in the north. From Ehud in the southern part of the highlands of uh, Samaria to uh, Barak and Deborah in the Jezreel Valley to Gideon around Shechem to Jephthah, in the Gilead, we are all in the territory of the Northern Kingdom, but it's not enough to say this. We have to go into details and identify the venue, the geography better, and then, of course, also the historical reality. Let's take some of these stories and tear them apart individually. Let's start with Ehud. So, uh, Ehud, yes. Ehud, the arena of the story, well, the story is west of the Jordan River and east of the Jordan River. So, west of the Jordan River, Ehud himself comes from a Benjaminite family. And the arena of the story west of jo Jordan, I suppose, is somewhere in the southern part of the territory of the Northern Kingdom in the highlands, which means not so far from Jerusalem to the north. In front of the Jordan and in front of Moab, and Moab is there only around the tip of the Dead Sea, not farther than that. By the way, I think that Jericho, not only me, I, I follow those who think that Jericho, the mention of Jericho there, is a later insertion. It is more complicated when uh, we try to identify the uh, situation east of the Jordan because the story tells about, speaks about the king of Moab. The story is a mockery in a way of uh, the king of Moab, this fat big guy, and how Ehud managed to trick him and his guards and to kill him. Uh, but it is important to notice that the reality of Moab reaching a border with the area west of the Jordan River near Jericho, somewhere there, north of the Dead Sea, in fact, this reality is only after the period of Mesha. Uh, Mesha's expansion 
uh, which means in the second half of the ninth century. And I suppose that the atmosphere here in the story is earlier than that. So perhaps, I'm just saying perhaps, Moab is also some sort of an insertion, a uh, later insertion of an author who, wo who really wishes to mock uh, Moab. And this comes from the period of, you know, uh, uneasy relationship between uh, Israel and Moab uh, after the expansion of Mesha to the north. The original story, what is it? Perhaps it dealt with Heshbon, a late, relatively late Canaanite, I would say, in quote-unquote city-state, in the northern part of what would be Moab, which means uh, east of the, of the Dead Sea, but in the northern part of the Dead Sea. We have a tradition regarding the conquest of Heshbon by the Omri dynasty in the Book of Numbers, in the Song of Heshbon, and in the story of Heshbon, in chapter 21 in the Book of Numbers, and maybe there is a connection here. So things are not very clear, but I, if you push me to the corner, Matt, I would say that the arena is quite clear, northern Moab and uh, the southern part of the highlands of the northern kingdom, and the period maybe sometime in the beginning of the ninth century BC as a reality with a question mark. How do you decide that the, the author is using Moab, you know, to make fun of Moab as a later edition and not representative of the, the time of, that, of the composition? In order to make uh, the story relate to Moab uh, as a king of Moab indeed, uh, the only way is to argue that the story reflects the situation in the first half of the 8th century. The first half of the 8th century is already the period of the composition of these uh, stories, as we'll see later. So I suppose that we need to push back. I think that the first half of the 8th century is too late for the reality, not composition, but the reality behind the tradition, because the tradition must have taken time until committed to writing. Uh, let's look at the next set of stories, that of uh, Barak and Deborah. Barak and Deborah in chapters four and five of the Book of Judges are especially interesting because uh, in scholarship usually they were taken as one story. Uh, two sectors, two sections, one the prose in chapter four and the song in chapter five. And you know that there is a big dispute about the song because some scholars presented the song of Deborah as one of the oldest texts in the Hebrew Bible and some suggested that it's uh, far later and in fact the number of uh, views regarding the date of the Song of Deb Deborah uh, is uh, exactly the same as the number of scholars who presented them, I suppose. But in any event, before going into the details of chronology, uh, uh, I wish to say that scholars, in my opinion, did not pay enough uh, attention to the geography of the stories. Once you give attention, you pay attention to the geography, in my opinion, humble opinion, there's no question we are dealing with two different stories. Because one story in chapter 4 plays in the eastern part of the lower Galilee to the north of the eastern part of the Jezreel Valley. Mount Tabor is there in the center, but part of the story is farther to the east, takes place farther to the east of Mount Tabor. So we are in the eastern part of the, southeastern part of the Lower Galilee. Whereas, let's take a look at the geography of the Song of Deborah. Which are the places mentioned in the Song of Deborah? Megiddo and Ta'anak first and foremost. So we are farther to the west, in the western sector of the Jezreel Valley. And there, then there are two other names that can be identified, not very well known, so we'll skip them here and not mention them, but they too are there in the western or southwestern corner of the Jezreel Valley. So these are two different geographies. One, southeast Lower Galilee, and the other one, southwest uh, Jezreel Valley. So two different uh, traditions. The question always when it comes to the savior stories is who is the enemy exactly? So in the story of chapter 4, the enemy is uh, the king of Hazor. 
But there's good reason to believe that the king of Hazor was imported probably from the book of Joshua. Because the center of action in, the, in chapter 4 is a city-state, a state, a place called Haroshet Agoim. Uh, there, there was a huge dispute about this name. How to understand Haroshet Agoim, which doesn't sound like a toponym. It sounds more like some sort of a polemic. What does it mean in Hebrew? Uh, that's the question. Because the, in Hebrew there is more than one um, solution to the meaning of the name. Whether it comes from Choresh, forest, whether it comes from Harish to plow, whether it comes from Choresh Mezimot, which means conspirators, something like that. So there is a polemic there, one way or another. And the easiest way to go is to identify this town with Anacharat, which is mentioned in the Bible, but also in late bones um, uh, correspondence, the Amarna uh, tablets, apparently, or hinted at, uh, let's put it this way at least. And this Anacharat could have been the center of the action there, of the dispute, the enemy of Barak, let's say. Now, if this is so, the name indeed Haroshet Agoim is a polemic. Perhaps indeed those who were conspirating against the people of Israel, something like that. Now, if we turn to the West, it is clear that the center of action is Megiddo. Megiddo also, from the point of view of archaeology, what we know about you know, the earlier phases of the Iron Age, let's put it this way. Now we turn to the chronology, what uh, is behind it. I think that it would be safe to say that what we see in the background is the turmoil in the valley in the later phases of the Iron One and the very beginning of the Iron Two, which means the final destruction of the late Canaanite cities in the valley and the takeover of the valley by the Highlanders, by the people of the Highlands, which means the very first steps in the expansion of uh, what uh, is going to become the Northern Kingdom of Israel. If so, and if we go with the date of the destructions, see, see it from the point of view of archaeology, radiocarbon dating, and so on, I suppose that the best would be to suggest that we are in the 10th century BC. So this makes it one of the oldest traditions in the biblical text. All the Savior's stories are old in the sense that they are, in my opinion, we'll see when we continue with the next uh, Savior or two, we are not later there than the beginning of the ninth century. What about Sisera and Yael? There's, of course, this famous epic painting of her driving the tent spike right into his skull. Ah, uh, yeah, I forgot to mention the most important names in the story, Sisera and uh, Yael. Sisera is there, could have been the legendary or not ruler in the memory of this uh, city in the Lower Galilee, which is the epicenter of the events uh, in chapter 4 in the book of Judges. I think that the episode of uh, Sisera and Yael is part of the old story. So yes, uh, it is important to, to mention it, absolutely. So let's go to the next one. That would be Gideon. Gideon. Now we are going to Gideon. Uh, let me be shorter on Gideon. Uh, the arena is uh, the uh, inheritance of the clan of Abiezer, uh, which is located in the highlands, and a little bit to the west or southwest of Shechem. But Shechem, in fact, is the center. Uh, perhaps Shechem is the enemy there. Then there is a section when Gideon chases his enemies, crosses the Jordan, goes to Transjordan. There is a question in biblical circles whether this is part of the old story or not. Let's leave it that way. One thing is for sure, in one place, today when we re you read the story, you hear the toponym Tabor, which is in the Jezreel Valley. And this is why also in modern Israeli maps, names were given to places in the Jezreel Valley which are related to the story in the Book of Judges. But there can be almost no question that Tabor is an insertion, a later insertion into the story. And the original story of Gideon plays somewhere there uh, in the area of Shechem, in the inheritance of, uh, let's say, what we call the tribe of Manasseh. Regarding uh, the date, 
difficult to say, looking at archaeology, Shechem was an important place in the late Bronze Age, very important, center of a big city-state, and apparently also recovered in the Iron One. And there is, I think, quite good evidence in the archaeological record for the destruction of Shechem in the very late 11th century BC, uh, around 1000 BC. Mm, contemporaneous with the destruction of Shiloh, about the same time. If now, w let me in parentheses say one more sentence. There is another story in the book of Judges, and this is the story of Abimelech. And the story of Abimelech, and biblical scholars are disputed regarding whether this is part of the Savior stories or not. In my opinion, there is a layer b there in the background which is part of the Savior stories and is also, and is also directed or centered around the city-state of Shechem. So I suppose that we are dealing here with traditions about Shechem uh, which come from the reality of around the very late 11th century or maybe a little bit later in the beginning of the, into the beginning of the 10th century because uh, destruction of Shechem, Shechem could not have been later than let's say the middle of the 10th century. And of course the Midianites play a role in the Gideon story. That seems out of place. It is true, the Midianites connect us immediately to the areas in the, mist, in the east, and the Midianites are mentioned in the story of uh, Gideon. But as I mentioned, the question is whether the part of Transjordan in the story is a, a sector of the original uh, tradition or not. Uh, I suppose that uh, basically it's better to focus on the area of Shechem uh, and leave the question whether Transjordan and the Midianites uh, are part of the original story. Then we have another story, the final one to speak about, Jephthah. Jephthah is in the Gilead, in Transjordan. And the action, the story, is about a town named Gilead, which gives the name to the territory, to the land of Gilead. It is south of the Jabok River in Transjordan, the story is also layered, and there are later layers there with geography which does not belong to the original story. The interesting thing, thing to note here is that there is this apiru atmosphere in the story, more than in other stories in the book of Judges, which means unruly situation. A hero comes and saves, you know, uh, the people, it, it's, it's, it's a story which take pla takes place on the border between the Israelites and the Ammonites. And the people of this uh, town, Gilead, they are sending to this uh, Jephthah to come to save them. And he is from a very kind of uh, vague problematic background and he becomes a hero and saves the town. So all this thing is, uh, reminds one of the Apiru stories, the uh, unruly situation before the consolidation of the kingdoms you know, uh, of the southern Levant. So the geography is clear in the G Gilead, and the time is also quite clear. It must be either a while before the consolidation of the northern kingdom with its part in the Gilead, or in the very early days. Definitely, in the time of the Omrides, we cannot expect to have Apiro groups uh, moving, uh, roaming the land, you know, and attacking uh, a town here and a town there. When you put together the geography from these savior stories, along with you know, the history of the Northern Kingdom as we've come to understand it through text and archeology, span what does all of this say for you? We are dealing uh, with the area in the highlands west of the Jordan, between, let's say, the tribe of Benjamin, a little bit to the north of Jerusalem, all the way to the Jezreel Valley. The Jezreel Valley, part of the territory of the lower uh, Galilee, overlooking the, in the south, the Jezreel Valley, and part of the Gilead. This is the territory that we are speaking about. And if I have to summarize the reality, I would say I can sense the atmosphere. This is not exact science, you know, two plus two, four. The atmosphere, I think, is, at, is an atmosphere which best fits the situation, I suppose, in the 10th century and beginning of the 9th century, somewhere there.
either a little bit before the rise of the Northern Kingdom or in the very early days before the Omrite dynasty. But it is not that simple. Uh, it is not that simple because I suggest to you to take a map and plant these people on the map, which means you put uh, on the map uh, Ehud and Heshbon and uh, Shechem and Megiddo and Anacharat. What you get is not a full map of these areas. There are empty places in the map and we have to try to understand uh, why and what was the solution of the author. Had there been an author of a book of saviors, as Richter suggested uh, last century in the 60s of the 20th century, in that case, how did that author look at the geography with parts of the territory missing? Can you elaborate a little bit on these gaps in the map? Uh, what's missing? Right, we have to fill the gaps, and I think that uh, the author of the Book of uh, Saviors uh, felt the same, because this author of the Book of Saviors, who, in my opinion, lived in the first half of the 8th century, he collected traditions around him, and when he put all the traditions on, uh, on his board, he noticed that uh, parts are missing, and the parts which are missing are important. Let me give you one or two examples. The northern part of the Gilead, which was Israelite, is missing. Even more important than that, the southern part of the highlands, the area of Ephraim, Ephraim was a very important part of the highlands of the Northern Kingdom, is missing from the story, from the stories. So what uh, did he do? He also collected, in my opinion, telegraphic memories that were there for what we call today the minor judges. And they appear in two sections in the book of Judges, in chapter 10 and in chapter 12. And when we, if we identify properly the geography of these uh, minor judges, it is possible to put them exactly into the missing parts in the map of the big saviors, of the important saviors. Let me give you one or two examples. Abdon, who is mentioned as one of the minor saviors, minor judges, uh, it is possible, I think, to identify him in the territory of the tribe of Ephraim. And then there is another one who, whom we, possible, uh, we can possibly put in the eastern part of the Jezreel Valley to compensate for the western part, which is Megiddo and the Song of Deborah. And then there is uh, another one, another minor uh, judges, minor savior, who can be put in the northern part of the Gilead. What I'm trying to tell you is that today, reading the two blocks of the minor judges in chapters 10 and 12, the language is deuteronomistic. However, behind it again, in this case too, we feel this atmosphere of the savior stories. So the stories are probably earlier and they were put to the service of the deuteronomistic historian in, later, uh, in a later phase. But uh, the important thing is that combined with the Book of Saviors, they really create the full map. The full map without missing parts of the highlands of the Northern Kingdom between Benjamin and the Jezreel Valley. The Jezreel Valley, the areas overlooking the Jezreel Valley from the north, and the two parts of the Gilead in Transjordan, south and north of the Jabok River. I'm sure the author who put all of these things together into this map had some sort of goal in mind. But before we get to that, can you, um, can you tell us what this map tells us in terms of the date of composition? Because I'm sure we're drawing yeah, that territorial. Yeah. Sure, you're right, Matt. Uh, in order to identify the goal, uh, there's always a goal. I think that these authors were highly sophisticated and there's always a message behind, especially behind a block of stories like this complicated, uh, there's something behind it. So what, what was in the head of the author who uh, put all this uh, together? Indeed, uh, asking a question about the period of composition is important because this can disclose also the author. The period of composition, one thing is for sure, we are pre-deuteronomistic here. 
because uh, it's a layer before the Deuteronomistic history. The Deuteronomistic history already is a reduction of the original story. So we are before. We are before the second half of the seventh century here. And we are in the north. So we have basically two options, either to say that these stories were composed, let's say, after the fall of the Northern Kingdom, in a place, I don't know where, in order to commemorate the heroic tales of the Northern Kingdom. But I suppose that we have to push back a little bit because the message, we'll speak about the message here, does not fit a period after the fall of the Northern Kingdom. The author needs to explain things within the history of the Northern Kingdom. And, 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 and a part of this, in the first half of the 8th century, before the collapse of the Northern Kingdom, we are in a period of unprecedented prosperity. And it should be identified with that prosperity. Uh, not to mention that we are already in a situation with capability of putting together literary texts, as we described in one of our previous conversations. And, si and since uh, at the end of the day we, we, we wish to put together all these traditions of the North into one story of understanding uh, what uh, happened, I think that uh, it is best to stick to the period of Jeroboam II in the first half of the, of the 8th century, the as the moment of composition, not the background of the stories. We make a separation here between the traditions, they reflect something earlier, and the moment of composition uh, in the first half of the 8th century. Why does someone in the time of Jeroboam want to collect these ancient stories from all over the kingdom? Well, you are basically asking me the most important question. What is the goal of the author? because the goal of the author will also disclose why to collect old memories. The geography is important here too. The geography cannot be a coincidence. It, it, it cannot be a coincidence that parts of the Northern Kingdom, which reflect the expansion of the Northern Kingdom in later phases of its history, uh, are not mentioned. We do not have a savior for the Galilee, a story for the Galilee. We do not have a savior for the um, Jordan Valley in the upper part around Hazor and Dan. No story about the Bashan. No story about the coast. There must be a reason for this. I think, my theory is, that the author tried to delineate the original territory of the Northern Kingdom, the core territory of the Northern Kingdom, the core territory of the Israelites. He tries to tell you who is an Israelite. He tries to tell you who is a real Israelite. And why does he do that? Perhaps because he is active in the first half of the 8th century, in the time of Jeroboam, in the time of the Nimshite dynasty. Now the Nimshites, they came after the Omrites. The Omrites are from the heartland, really, of the highlands. But the Nimshites apparently come from the eastern part of the Jezreel Valley. So they want to show that they are part of core Israel, that they are part of real Israel. And the expansion of the Northern Kingdom is considered in a different way. Please pay attention to the very interesting fact that, we, I mean, we spoke about the conquest tradition in one of our previous conversations. And I suggested to you, Matt, that behind the conquest tradition in Joshua, which is definitely Deuteronomistic, there is another layer of a northern tradition of conquest. And indeed, now that we have the map uh, of the core territory of Israel, according to the ideas of the uh, composer of the Book of Saviors, let's put it this way, and we, and we draw the map, and now please add the conquests to this land, there is no overlap. The conquest stories, the northern conquest stories, they should be connected to the core Israel tradition in order to show the expansion of the northern kingdom because the conquest stories are about what? About the conquest of the Galilee and the Jordan Valley in, in the incident in the famous story about Hatzor and so on and the, the conquest of uh, the Shephelah uh, and the highlands of Judah. In fact, this is an overarching, you know, moment that we are looking at the traditions and concepts of the Northern Kingdom. 
what they consider as core Israel and what they consider as the united monarchy ruled by core Israel, in a way. The author in the early 8th century, he's writing in the time of Jeroboam, he's compiling these stories, and he's specifically trying to highlight the, the one true core Israel to make some sort of ethnic distinction between the conquered territories? What, what is his view of these conquered territories that he's excluding them? I suppose that the answer is the following, that he makes a distinction between core Israel and those conquered territories where uh, uh, he is dealing, uh, the northern authors were dealing with the people living on the border between Israel and Aram, the Aramean kingdoms, people living between Israel, on, on the border of Israel and the Phoenicians, people living on the border between Israel and the Philistines, and so on. So for them, it was important to delineate, the to make a distinction. All this is part of the Northern Kingdom. All this is definitely part of the great united monarchy ruled by Jeroboam, if you wish, from Samaria. Oh, we are sitting here in Kiryat Yarim. This is part of the story. We will speak about it in a future conversation. But still, within this great united monarchy, they make this uh, division between the core territory, the real Israelites, and all those who were taken over and they are part of the, uh, of the big uh, empire or mini empire, but they are to be distinguished from the core. Let's summarize the function of these savior stories. I think that uh, the savior stories absolutely come from the Northern Kingdom. These traditions uh, uh, probably delineate uh, the situation in this territory either before the rise of the Northern Kingdom or the early days of the Northern Kingdom. The best example is perhaps the uh, instability in the Jezreel Valley and surroundings in chapters uh, 4 and 5 of the Book of Judges. Uh, the geography uh, is a very interesting one. The author tries to uh, put together a map of core Israel or core Israelites, which means the territory of the Northern Kingdom in the highlands, north of Jerusalem to the Jezreel Valley, the Jezreel Valley is included, and of course Transjordan, which was part, the Gilead, part of the Northern Kingdom from the outset, apparently. Uh, maybe he tries to do this because he is active in the first half of the 8th century. This is the moment of composition to distinguish from the memory behind the story. And uh, perhaps he does this in order to show that the Nimshites, the kings, and especially Jeroboam II, the great king, of the first half of the 8th century, when this author is active, well, the Nimshites are part of real Israel. They come from the valley, from the eastern valley, so the story needs to show that they are, aims to show that they are part of real, is, real Israel. Uh, there is no way to understand these traditions without taking into consideration the northern conquest traditions, which are behind the book of Joshua. So we are speaking about stories behind Judges and stories behind Joshua. The conquest traditions of the North apparently complete the map of the great united monarchy according to the Northern ideology, ruled from Samaria, Israel and Judah together. So the territories which were, so to speak, taken over uh, complete the map of core Israel. Two components, core Israel and the conquered territories. And in any event, both traditions, the savior stories and judges, and the conquest traditions and Joshua, went later through very strong deuteronomistic uh, reduction and uh, editorial work. And uh, in the way that they are presented to us today in the book of Judges and the book of Joshua, they serve Judahite, not anymore Israelite ideology. They were inherited by Judahite authors in order to serve Judahite uh, ideology, especially territorial uh, ideology and theology also in the book of Judges, the cycle that brings about the rise of the Davidic dynasty 
and in uh, Joshua, the idea of the conquest of the land, which is in fact conquest uh, to be under the great King Josiah uh, of Judah in the seventh century. So we definitely need to be aware all the time that we read these stories, be aware of the distinction between the original uh, traditions, northern traditions, let's say in the eighth century and before, and the, the later Deuteronomistic uh, layer in the seventh century BC. And of course, in both uh, sectors of the Bible, there are also later layers. Okay, we want to deal with one more northern tradition, and we'll do that next time. So let's meet back at Kiryat Yerim and talk about the Ark narrative. Thanks, Israel. Sure.